Hello, you've reached the RhinoCast. We're about to start the podcast, so please make it quick. Hi, guys. It's Dr. Rhino. I'm running late because the pizza I ordered is still in the oven. Did you get the fresh anchovies again? Blah. No, I got the canned ones. Classy. Well, don't sweat it. We have the pre-recorded intro ready to rock. Hey, thanks. Hey, want me to save you a slice? No, thanks. I'm off, though. Ladies and gentlemen, record geeks, retired plate spinners, and millennials who want to impress their parents with their record collections. Welcome to the Rhino Cast Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Get ready for new releases, deep tracks, and conversations with your favorite artists and bands. And balloons for the kiddies. And now, your hosts with the most, Rich Mahan and Dennis the Menace. Coming up on this RhinoCast, our special guest Gene Simmons shares how you can get the combination to his one-of-a-kind vault experience. Are you ready? Yeah. Thanks for nothing. I ain't lying. Well, you can shove it where the sun don't shine. Give me a kiss by your lips. Oh, let your backbone slip. I am pleasure. I am pain. If it's so good, you can back again. You won't snatch the fantasy. Hey, Rich. Hey, Dennis. Rich, today we're going to take it to the bank. I always like going to the bank. Well, good, because today we're talking to one of the most iconic people in rock and roll history who's documented his career for his fans with a -a one-of-a-kind box set. I mean, seriously, it's a vault. A vault, like a real safe with a combination. You can't make this stuff up. I got to go deep into an L.A. canyon to the home of Gene Simmons for a very personal tour of the Gene Simmons vault. This is the real thing, and there aren't very many of them available. What's in it? Well, 150 tracks that you can't get anywhere else. Okay. But every single vault also comes with Gene Simmons in person. So this isn't only bigger than life as you would expect from Gene, this is actually him in real life along with the vault. Yes, he delivers it to you and shares stories, one-of-a-kind archival collectibles, and more. I would imagine Gene has a lot to say about it in your conversation. Yes, in fact, we better get to it because it's full of surprises just like the vault and maybe even a song or two. Well, let's unlock this right now. The Gene Simmons Vault Experience on the RhinoCast. Hello, Gene. Hi, everybody. It's Gene Simmons, not Richard Simmons. I think that it's important for people to know why we're really here today, which is to talk about... What we're talking about is the GeneSimmonsVault.com box set. I wish there was another word instead of box set because this is literally like nothing that's ever been done under the guise of a box set. It's literally and figuratively the largest box set of all time. It's about three feet tall, weighs about... 38 pounds, and is made out of hardware, metal hardware. That's just one of the handles. And inside, I mean, it looks like a safe. Inside is 50 years of my recorded history going all the way back to 1966, about a year and a half to two years after I first saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. I taught myself how to strum acoustic guitar and started coming up with melodies and lyrics. And one of the first songs I ever wrote was a song called My Uncle is a Raft. So most people don't know or maybe don't care that I first started playing guitar. I wasn't a bass player. And I found out that McCartney, likewise, although I'm no McCartney, actually played guitar first and they didn't have a bass player, so... And so the first chord I ever learned was this, a C, and then an A minor, and then an F, although I make it a little fancy. My 
uncle is a rough and he always keeps me floating he is so good to me he treats me tenderly doesn't matter who you are and I didn't know what the words meant or anything else. I had an Uncle George who was like a substitute father figure for me because mine ran out a long time ago. And one of the first songs I ever wrote is My Uncle is a Raft. And that's in the box set. And later on I started to learn different chords, you know, like... Uh, Just begun since you've gone. To understand, I'm the only one. And if you cross your Self at night, I'll turn and see you. Don't run and hide. I'm always near you. I'm always near. been written Gene I mean to give you a sense of 150 tracks if you didn't take a poopy break or stop to grab a sandwich or something you'd be sitting on your butt for over 10 hours that's how long that is and inside are tracks I've co-written with Bob Dylan about 18 years ago Bob was kind enough to come over to my home this this area here and we sat around strum guitars, and three songs came out of that. In the 70s, I found a group called Van Halen, and the Van Halen brothers were kind enough to join me in the studio. So Power Trio recorded Christine 16 and two other tracks that are in the box set. Joe Perry from Aerosmith on a track, all the Kiss guys, including Ace, going all the way back decades and for me, this is a life's work, but really a hidden life's work. Nobody's heard this. It's never been released. And I guess part and parcel of the fact that my songwriting has never been linear, I have other alter egos that the fans have never heard. So, you know, they know about War Machine and Calling Dr. Love and Rock and Roll All Night, that stuff. But there's an awful lot of other stuff which you just can't quite put your thumb on, your finger on, because stylistically it just doesn't sound like Kiss. And then other tunes sound like songs Kiss should have recorded. And so for me, this is a labor of love. So I want to dig a little deeper. Let's go back to Dylan. Tell me about those tracks. Well, the way the Bob Dylan, Gene Simmons relationship started is that I, like most things in my life, I don't care of, about the consequences because the only thing that's possible on the negative side is no, you're on crack. Why would you do that? You know, why would you think you could write a song with Bob Dylan? On the positive side, it's yeah, sure, why not? So there are only two choices. So why not? You got about 50 50. Anything can happen. So I picked up the phone and called the manager who was telling me, well, you know, everybody write, wants to write with Bob. But within two days, Bob was over at my house in an unmarked white van with an acoustic guitar, came up to my place, and we sat around 
me with my guitar, he with his guitar, and just started strumming and coming up with ideas, lyrics, melody, chords, and three songs came out of that. Not only that, but I've got the actual songwriting recording process as Bob and I are trading licks back and forth. And that was, you know, one of the real life highlights for me. One of the things about KISS, and and particularly in your work, that you can't genreize it. You can't put it in a genre. People would try to call it classic rock or hard rock. So as relating to the to the the vault, among the many surprises is that there's going to be a, a, a serious expansion of what I just described. The songs and one of the challenges of putting 150 songs in some kind of order was very daunting. Originally, it was going to be linear, starting 1966, the oldest track, and then going through 10 different CDs and going through sort of a linear calendar time period, winding up with the last CD is 2016. And I decided against that because it just didn't flow as well. You know, you you get a deck of cards and you go one, two, three, four, five, six. There are infinite variations that you can put together of those 52 cards. I've got 150 different cards that I can arrange in different ways. And so I let the music do the talking and started off. In fact, when I first started moving the songs around, there was more than one comment that said, how come you're not starting the box set with one of the songs you've written called Are You Ready? I went, you know what? You're right. I didn't even think of that. That idea didn't come from yours truly. So the, And once I put Are You Ready at the top, which is guitar heavy and sounds like a song that maybe Kiss should have recorded, then it sort of started to make sense. Let's start off with the songs that felt like, you know, gee, the lost songs that Kiss never recorded. And then it segues into, and that takes two or three CDs, then it segues into the lost demos that people have never heard of the original versions of Calling Dr. Love, Rock and Roll All Night, and Christine 16, all that stuff. And then and then we go off on tangents. We start to hear uh, sort of this softer, more melodic, lots of harmonies, some Beatles, some Eagles kind of style of songs, and even some keyboard-based songs that have no guitar whatsoever on them. And then some are acoustic. So there, Because when I first started writing and recording songs, Sgt. Pepper had yet to be recorded. When I first started recording, it was on a two-track there were only four-track machines in use at that time. In 1966, there were no eight-tracks. By 1967, a year later, the Beatles had gone in to record Sgt. Pepper. They used two four-track machines. There were no eight-track machines. They bounced. They bounced back and forth. And people don't know what that means, but suffice it to say they were very primitive recording equipment. And... So along through the years, my songs kept being recorded on all kinds of different technology that was available at the time. Two-track, four-track, eight-track, 16-track, 24-track, and then finally, 72 tracks. But by the way, the thing that you wind up learning over the years is more is not necessarily better, and sometimes less is more. A good song is a good song, and it's tough to write a good song. I'm talking about myself or anybody else, except for the Beatles, goddammit, who seem to have been able to write hundreds of good songs. Most of us, you know, you're lucky if you get just a handful out of a hundred. But they were able to, I don't know what that is, and they don't come from Paris or London or New York. They came from Liverpool, of all places. And the third best songwriter in the band is a guy that wrote... Oh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps and something. And, you know, he would be the best songwriter of any band. And he's the third best one. That says something about the Beatles. It's a a, a singularity is what scientists call. So to say that I was inspired by them and uh, Ray Charles and, you know, Fats Domino and some of that stuff would be an understatement. A lot of that runs through 
my music and specifically how old R&B rhythm and blues records had horn parts, which is why a lot of the riffs that Kiss uses, which were my contributions along with the songwriting, sound less like bass parts and more like horn parts when the when the guitars double it. It's not like a lot of basses are like Motown basses. I don't play like that. John Lennon, you probably saw the documentary, had the John Lennon jukebox that he used to carry with him on tour with his favorite Phil Spector and his Chuck Berry and yeah. all of that. I look at this for fans... As your version of of that, you know, you're giving back to the fans. The fans never had access to John Lennon's jukebox, but they have incredible access to the vault. Yeah, and up until now, I'd never released it because I didn't want to do uh, just a piece of it. I wanted uh, piggishly to release all of it, but record industry was in chaos, dysfunction. The fans were downloading and file sharing and iClouds and popcorn farts and other things. So it just you couldn't hold something in your hand. At my era, records were art. I used to buy albums just for the artwork. And there were art shows, art galleries that talked about the art of putting together an album. And they were some of them were pop up covers and double albums with packet. The packaging was every bit as important. You were making a statement. It was art. Now it's just music. And Kiss, by the way, has the same philosophy. We took great pride in putting the album packages together, as well as the shows. Audio visual. You want to. You want to let somebody feel it, touch it, hear it. If we could make them taste it and use all five senses. It's what we would like to do. And so this is as close as I can get to using as many of your senses as possible. There's an awful lot of music, different kinds of music. It's not a one-trick pony. Then you've got the powerful and attractive Gene Simmons action figure and a 50,000-word book that I wrote every word of. There's no editing. Nobody else doing that. And there photos and stories and my artwork and lyrics and all that of the actual creation of the vault where i was who was there and so on i want to go back to the action figure and this is about detail the amount of thinking that went into every inch of this thing whether it's the way it was constructed but let's just use the action figure as a metaphor for that when you touch the jeans, they feel like jeans. When you touch the leather jacket, it feels like a leather jacket. I mean, this this is a level of, of detail. There's no detail I've seen on any action figure that has this, including the bottom and the detail on the studs, you know, on the uh, metal boot coverings, which I have on. In fact, those are patterned after the leather boots that I'm wearing now that's got, you know, all that detail and when you put your hand on the leather jacket that I'm wearing on the wearing on the action figure, it feels like leather. Yes, it does. And of course, my wonderful hair, which nobody else has on earth. Well, the other thing that's really difficult is the smallest part in these action fig this action figure are actually those two legs, but they're weighted down so that it doesn't fall over. And this because is your first non makeup action figure too. This is, is it without not? makeup. Yeah, the only one I've ever done. And then, of course, there's this large collectible gold-type coin, which in Latin says two different things on both sides. On one side, it says, In Jean confidumus. God bless you. Which means, In Jean we trust. And on the other side, it says, Si vos es harbe. Anyway, take my word for it. It's Latin, and it means, if it's too loud... You're too old. Is it okay for us to talk about the Cracker Jack surprise? Sure. Uh-oh, I guess I just revealed it. So when I was a kid, I used to buy Cracker Jack's boxes. And when I was a kid, they were a favorite of all of us in school. You'd go to the candy store, and the candy stores used to serve soda and comic books and all that. And you used to go and buy 
your Cracker Jacks. Now, Cracker Jacks was a box with a sailor for some reason, some sailor on the cover. And on the in inside, you had peanuts and popcorn, and they were caramel covered. And they were good enough, you know, they tasted fun and all that. But the real draw, when you bought your Cracker Jacks box, you'd get a surprise. And you never knew what the surprise inside the box was, and that was the draw. So I used to buy boxes. If I'd have, you know, a dollar, I'd, I'd spend 25 cents on each box and buy four of them just to get the prizes. And then I was, of course, stuck with tons of uh, peanuts and popcorn, caramel covered, of course. And cavities. There you go. And and it didn't have to be, you know, lost diamonds or the, you know, the King Solomon's mines or anything like that. As long as it was surprise. I mean, I get why people don't open their Christmas presents until Christmas Day. Who wants to find out what, what you're going to get for Christmas in July? So we all like that stuff. And that's what I wanted to do with the surprise including a secret compartment inside every box set. First of all, when you open the box set, the light goes on. There's a secret compartment down there. If you push it, it opens up. And from my private collection, I'm going to make sure no two vaults are the same. I put in uh, stage-worn leather gloves or lyrics or actual cassettes, that one-of-a-kind stuff, and just give them away to the fans so that any box set that you get is different than any other box set. Something personal from me to every single fan who gets the vault. And I've seen a few, and there's some pretty cool stuff. Some of those cassettes that are one of a kind that's on my wall, I literally went went over there and just took some off and stuck them in. Wow. Yeah, along with original lyrics and stuff. You can double, quadruple, or more uh, the cost of one of these vaults just by selling the lyrics. Where we're sitting right now, I, I cannot even imagine the the effort of choice on your part because you, you certainly collect you in a massive way. Well, it's so much fun. You know, I'm luckiest son of a bitch who ever walked the face of the planet. I get to be in America's number one gold record award-winning group of all time. I get to wear more makeup and higher heels than the chicks do. I get to have an awful lot of fun on stage, Spitfire, do all that kind of stuff. But Kiss, unlike any other band, is so collectible, and there's so many thousands of items that every other day there are boxes full of stuff that come in that you would never imagine. Everything from Kiss condoms to Kiss caskets will get you coming and will get you going. See what I did there? You know, I'm old enough to have seen young men in the Catskills at the Concord Hotel, where he's com coming out with his uh, violin. When I was born, I was so ugly, the doctor slapped my mother. Boom, boom, tsh. To call this a box set, forgetting the fact that it's a safe is kind of silly, because this thing we're looking at here is just the beginning of a full narrative that goes with the vault. Well, this has never been done before. It's not only the largest box set of all time, but on my dime, I'm going to pay for flights, hotels, insurance, security, all that. And I'm going to roll up my sleeves and hop on a commercial flight, and I'm going to go to the fans, wherever they are, at a convenient time in a convenient place, and literally hand the largest box set of all time into their sweaty little paws. And that has to do with something that I never got as a kid. Elvis never knocked on my front door and yelled inside, Hey, Gene, open up check out my new album, it's Elvis. Because there's always that separation between fan and band. You know, you're on stage, the fans are on their, standing on their seats in the audience, but you've got a separation from the stage. And you, Or if I'm walking down the street or going into a hotel, there's a security, all right, stand back. So I'm literally going to, no private jets, none of that stuff. I want to get on commercial flights, go around the world, and hand deliver the box sets to every fan that gets them, now, by the way, there are only, as they say, there's only a few left. GeneSimmonsVault.com. While supplies last, first come, first served. After these few thousand, there's a few thousand on Earth. There'll be four or 500 for Japan, maybe 800 for Germany, like that, around the world. And after those are gone, there will be no more. Let's talk about the two experiences. 
Well, you can just buy the the vault, however many there are left. Go to GeneSimmonsVault.com. They go for $2,000. Not one penny cheaper, not one penny more. A Rolls-Royce is 500000 That's what it is. It's not for everybody. On the other hand, the Rolls-Royce people are not going to drive the car to your home if you're in another country. You have to go to the store, or, you know, wherever. I'm going to change all that. I'm going to literally hand deliver me, not some delivery guy, not UPS. I'm going to be the one that's going to hand deliver the proudest thing I've ever done to the fans. Now, it is true that if you want me to spend the day with you and 25 of your friends, the Gene Simmons home experience, you want to go to a club, invite 25 of your friends, do karaoke or jam with your band, I'm there. You want me to go to your house and pet the dog or do other things to it, I'm there. Uh, that goes for 50K. If you invite 25 of your friends and you're paying 50K, that is just a little more than going on a kiss cruise. And what you're going to get for that is number one, your 25 well, friends are going to be indebted to you for the rest of your life. They and you may. can collect money from them. They may. You can. Uh, no, I don't want to come off like a used car salesman or anything no, like that. No, no, of course not. This is not. not for everybody. It's just for the super fans who want it. And I'm here to do it because I'm going to be out there for a year. Kiss is not touring. We're going to do a few, maybe five shows in Spain, and that's it. So for the next 12 months, I'm going around the world, and I'm going to devote myself to meeting my bosses. And uh, truthfully, I'm doing this for myself. I'm 68 now, although I still have hair on my head and probably more on my back. But I'm closer to the end than I was when I was 20 years old. And I don't know about you, but it, when I see the finish line coming up, I speed up and I do more. And so do most of us. And when we're 20 years old, we're stupid, wet behind the ears, and we think we're invulnerable and will last forever. And I want to do this as a once-in-a-lifetime memory. I'll never be able to do it again, and this is the right time. Now that Kiss has climbed you know, the heights that anybody could ever dare imagine, and it, we're not going anywhere. We're touring. We're doing fine. But if there's ever going to be a time for the GeneSimmonsVault.com box set to ever come out, now is the time. And again, it's not going to be for everybody. This is going to be for a few thousand fans around the world, and that's it. No more after that. So I don't want to be the, you know, I want to throw the biggest party and go on a personal journey to meet the fans who made it all possible. I mean, I know it sounds corny and all that stuff, but I can afford it. I'm going to do this because nobody's ever done it. I've never done it, and I intend before this journey is over to be able to point back to it as a lifetime memory. So in our full announcer voice, let's just go really quickly with what people get in the vault. So GeneSimmonsVault.com. You can't order the vault anywhere else. It will not appear in stores or, as they say, retail. No downloading, file sharing, none of that stuff. One place to get it if you want the full, you know, the full three-foot-tall, 38-pound monster that you see in front of you. Inside is 150 tracks that have never been released, spanning 50 years that include on, on 10 CDs that include songs I've co-written with Bob Dylan, the Van Halen brothers are on it, Joe Perry from Aerosmith, all the Kiss guys, Paul and Ace and everybody. And it spans 150 songs over 50 years from 1966 until 2016. But wait, there's even a 50,000 word book, quite substantial, that has hundreds and hundreds of photos from my private collection. Stories about where the songs were written, who I was around, and so on. A Gene Simmons action figure. I, quite honestly, the highest quality one I've ever seen. And a gold collectible coin, which you have to see to believe. And when you open the GeneSimmonsVault.com box set, a light comes on. And there's also, besides all the other fun stuff, a hidden compartment, a secret compartment. And literally, if you push it, it opens up, and inside are personal items, personal collectibles that come from my collection, and no two vaults are going to be the same. 
And is there another surprise CD in there, perhaps? Uh, there's anything is possible. I know. But I'm not going to talk about it. There you go. Anything's possible. You'll. I'll say this accurately. There are at least 150 songs that have never been released. At least. There are at least 10 CDs guaranteed. Anything well, is possible. Anything is possible. Gene, thank you for taking the time. It was a pleasure to see me. It was a pleasure to see you. And it was a pleasure to, uh, to get the intimate details of the vault. You're playing us out. wagons and sound the alarm it's time for the rhino roundup hi there this is lauren g and john hughes and this is the rhino roundup we've got a good one for you we've got the grateful dead best of the grateful dead volume 2 1977 to 1989 it's the second and final volume of the band's 2015 compilation the best of the grateful dead the double lp is on 180 gram it includes songs from terrapin station Shake Down Street. Got a lot of really cool stuff on here. All remastered. Cool. Speaking of lots of stuff and remastered, the More of the Monkeys Super Deluxe Edition is up for order now. 91 tracks over three CDs, 55 of those previously unreleased. But the gem of this box is a recently discovered concert recording from 1967, which is now the band's earliest known live concert that exists. There's also a bonus 7-inch of a remix of I'm a Believer, and really cool, the B-side is a vocals-only mix of I'm Not Your Steppin' Stone. So that is the Rhino Roundup for this week. Rich, that was one demonic rhino cast, wasn't it? The kind only Gene Simmons could inspire with the Gene Simmons vault? I know, this is the ultimate limited edition, and there's only one way to get it. GeneSimmonsVault.com Rich, I gotta go before they're all gone. I hear ya. So let's kiss this rhino cast goodbye, and we'll see everyone next time. I think that is safe to say. And last but certainly not least, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next RhinoCast. Executive producers for Rhino, John Hughes and Lauren Goldberg. Produced for Rhino by Popcult and Rich Mayhan Promotions. All rights reserved. <laughs>